Welcome back to our uh, final session for the day. Um, uh, this is the first day of the um, virtual event from the uh, CNI uh, Fall uh, 2021 member meeting. And um, we will bring the day to a flamboyant conclusion. Um, let me welcome back uh, Joan Lippincott, our um, Associate uh, Director um, Emeritus. Um, we are always very, very happy to see Joan back with us. And um, she's going to be moderating a wonderful panel today. Um, this ties in very much to some of the questions we have been touching on earlier about what to do in physical space, what to do in virtual space, how to make decisions, what works best where. Um, and uh, I think uh, Joan and her panel are going to give us a, uh, an, another series of perspectives on that. Um, so I will just welcome Joan and thank her panelists for joining us. And um, I'll let Joan um, uh, introduce her panel rather than uh, my doing so. So I will just say welcome all of you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, great to see you. Um, uh, and um, I'll get out of the way. Thanks so much, Cliff. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to moderate a panel of three very talented individuals who will talk about where we're headed as we work with our communities of users in physical and virtual spaces in the near future. Many of you are grappling with uncertainties in your own institutions. Do you renovate or create new high-tech spaces that turned out to be off limits in libraries who had them during many months of the pandemic? Do we think differently about hybrid environments? How will capabilities of technologies for high-end digital projects evolve in virtual space? What is it about working in physical spaces that has been and remains important for our staff and user communities? Our panelists will provide perspectives on these issues. <clears throat> they are Dale Askey, Vice Provost, Library and Museums and Chief Librarian at University of Alberta. Formerly, he headed the Digital Scholarship Center at McMaster University and is currently a member of the CNI Steering Committee. Salwa Ismail is Associate University Librarian for Digital Initiatives and Information Technology and Associate CIO at UC Berkeley. She's been very active in the EDUCAUSE community and was formerly a librarian at Georgetown. Park Rhodes is Principal, Vantage Technology Consulting Group, where he works with higher education institution and others on planning technology strategies. He's been an active and thoughtful participant in a series of discussions sponsored by the Learning Spaces Collaboratory in which I've been involved. This session will be recorded. We won't be using any slides. I'll be monitoring the chat for your questions and we may be able to take a couple after each segment, but if not, we'll address as many as possible at the end of the session. In the meantime, please feel free to share with your colleagues your own experiences in the chat. To begin, each of our panelists will set the context from the perspective of their own background and institution or company. And we'll start with Salwa, over to you. Great, thank you for the introduction, Joan, and hello, everyone. It's afternoon here, so I'm just gonna say good afternoon. Um, so when we first started this discussion in our group here um, around supporting and making complex and high touch technologies more future proof, initially we thought we weren't just limiting ourselves to just the lessons from the past two years of the pandemic and as the pandemic continues. Um, but it was also hard for us to not allow that to impact our thinking and um, the work that we do in our spaces. 
So for me, just like most of the universities at my campus, uh, prior to the pandemic, we were an in-person default mode on-site campus. Activities happened on campus at University of California, Berkeley, as many of you know, protests happened on campus. Our students like to work on campus, the communities that they have. Our instructors and faculty are the same. Hence, most of our technology spaces, the regular ones, but also the ones that are centered around high touch, were all around the physical experience, our classrooms and teaching spaces, our maker spaces, our digital signages. Um, and usually we think about these things in terms of digital initiatives, but what we also forget are in these high touch and high use uh, complex technological spaces included are the compute clusters. Uh, where's the secure data being computed? The data clusters that many of our faculty members use for their compute environments. For us, all of this was all centered around the in-user, in-person experience. So much of my discussions going forward here as we continue will be around how we planned and strategized uh, technology selection, digital implementation, migration, and enabled hybrid mode. And how will we continue to do that, how, how we did that during the pandemic, but also how will we continue to do that now that we're back on site? Um, and how will that add a new lens for the future planning that we will do? Um, that would that is my context setting for how my answers will be discussed here. Perfect. Thanks so much, Solid. And next we have Park. Got a delay here on my microphone mute button. Um, thank you, Joan, and, and thank you for that introduction. That was uh, genuinely um, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, so I am uh, I'm, I'm a consultant to libraries, but primarily I think my wheelhouse in this conversation as is maybe as a technologist um, at all levels. So I have I have been uh, sort of in the engine room designing systems, and I have been at leadership level um, uh, leading the charge around technology for the enterprise, and somewhere in the middle as a scholar thinking about it as a futurist or a, a appropriate technology. And I think a lot of what I see in this moment is really sort of the disruption model. You know, pandemic um, uh, did many things, but amongst them was was to to really disturb and and to limit the ways that we were all connected. It didn't change our objectives as humans to stay connected, to continue to share knowledge. All the mission of a library didn't change, but all the tools and the typical pathways were suddenly disrupted, and we found new ones. And um, uh, I think much of my perspective in all of this is is about how now that we are we we're not necessarily going back right we have a new paradigm we have in this moment really experienced a massive adoption change we have discovered new tools because our the, the typical paths were not available to us even if these are tools like zoom that we all knew about um, suddenly everything went there and so now there's a beautiful moment for us to take a step back and i think this conversation starts to explore that and look at um the whole panoply of things before us and say, OK, we want to accomplish this. This is our objective. And how does that impact? You know, is the, is the right tool for this something that is physical? Do we build this out into space or is this something, for instance, the, the previous um, presentation, you know, which which was almost completely virtual, right? Not a tangible thing, but still an important part of mission and outreach and collaboration. And so I think of, uh, of this moment as um, uh, a new entrepreneurial opportunity for us to explore these tools. Thank you, Park. Dale, over to you. Uh, great, thanks, Joan. And um, I, I take Cliff's use of the word uh, flamboyant to describe this panel as both a, uh, an inspiration and a challenge. So we'll, we'll try to live up to that. Um, I, I made some notes about what I what I think the, the context is for this conversation. So I, I felt that that we, you know, libraries, but mainly our institutions around us, we we triage the, the criticality of our spaces during the pandemic based on really, really outdated criteria. And at, at my institution, I've heard this from other institutions, there was a real emphasis on reading in computer rooms, you know, student spaces where they could sit and work on a computer or, or work. And that feels to me very, uh, very outdated and it begs the question why? And if you think about it for a minute, um, part of what happened was libraries lost some of the authority over their spaces. Suddenly a whole bunch of public health rules 
came on and, and now people wanted to talk about our space. And some of these people hadn't thought about, if they ever thought about it, hadn't thought about library space in decades. So they go back to their notions of being students in the before times, the before before times. And so that's not necessarily a good basis for these kinds of, of conversations. So for example, one of the things was, you know, how do you provide computer access to students who might have technology problems? So I'm glad that some students, some, some of my colleagues at the senior administrative level were thinking about these digital divide issues, but the most expensive way to do it is to leave a computer room open that's huge, like a library. That is the most expensive way to get people access to a network. There are a thousand other ways to do it that cost less money and are probably less inconvenient and less risky for the students during a pandemic. But that's not the path we chose, and I know that I'm not alone with that. Um, you know, if I think about what is what's been lost, what's been gained during the pandemic, it really is to the spaces and, and especially sort of the high contact, high touch spaces, high tech spaces we have. Losses, obvious, random encounters, spontaneous learning, spontaneous interaction. That's that's just stating the obvious. Um, it can happen virtually, but that's the exception, not the rule. Everything's pretty highly regimented. Everything's pretty structured in a in virtual environment. And I would observe that I think in general, with some exceptions, in the virtual environment, discourse degrades. We have less risk, rich conversations. We have less probing. We have less ability to freewheel than we do in a, in a virtual. And I think it's as this wears on, I think a lot of us are really waking up to that. On, on the gain side, and it's kind of an odd gain, Luddites are in super sharp focus now. We know who they are. They've sort of had to put their hand up and declare themselves. So we had people saying, we need to have stack access. Well, other people were over here using the Hadi Trust Emergency Access quietly in much greater numbers. And so we, we chose to stick with Hadi as opposed to listen to the people saying that not touching books was you know, ending their lives and their careers, which, which is basically what they were telling us. Um, so that's, I think I'll leave it at that. The other, well, the, other, the other gain is that we've expanded our networks. We have bigger networks than we used to be. That's a plus of the virtual environment. We can expand our wings a little bit. I'll stop there. Thanks all of you for really starting us off with some thought provoking ideas. And now here's my first question. It's quite broad and I'd like you to uh, cover a variety of aspects in your, in your answers. Looking ahead, but informed by the pandemic experience, how do you suggest library leaders think about planning for new or renovated technology rich physical spaces versus moving more into virtual spaces? And I'd like you to consider things like uh, what, um, what kinds of technologies uh, are you thinking about? What is it about the physical space that you would suggest be considered? And what about the human and social considerations? So all of you touched a little bit on some of these issues, but I'd like you to go more in depth. And we'll start with Park this time. Yeah, I'm going to try and make my response brief because I'm, I'm eager to hear from Dale and Sawa on this. Um, uh, when it comes to physical versus virtual, I'm not sure. It's a little bit of a false dichotomy. Um, I think that, that I've sort of forecasted this answer already in that um, there are certain things that the physical is the best for. Um, if we want to acquire tangible skills, hands-on skills, or we want to collaborate together, um, or you're trying to you know, guide people or make it that connection, um, uh, I think, you know, you ask, why do we want to accomplish this? Where, what is the best tool to accomplish this? And there may be situations where you need a, a in particular, um, with the dawn of digital scholarship, you might need some sort of platform that can render um, the, the digital uh, so people can, can now tangibly collaborate on it together. Um, uh, I think you know, virtual may be the space where it might not be as, uh, I mean, define virtual, right? It's, it's all these questions. What do you mean by virtual? What do you mean by high flex? Um, are we trying to accomplish a some sort of equitable experience between people who can physically join us and people who cannot? Uh, that might be a significantly different configuration. Uh, if there's a different tool than if high flex is, how are we supporting the same level of scholarship uh, or the same level of engagement with the library and its knowledge base um, remotely or physically, which might be two different programs, two different platforms. Um, that's fanciful, but I think you, you know it may there's um, uh, it may be that there's a lot of Pareto principle here, 80-20. Um, there may be a lot of very simple things that people can do that it's not 
you know, video walls everywhere. Um, and there may be a, a need for, in some cases, those specialty spaces. Um, what is true for me, I think, is that moving forward with these two realms means that we're going to, this is something I think Sawa can comment on really well, uh, how we fund them might be very differently, right? A capital op, uh, uh, project versus uh, something that we stand up that is virtual, um, uh, how we build them and how we leverage them for the mission, which might not change much, but the tools we have and how we leverage them to accomplish that mission, I think is going to constantly accelerate. Uh, I think I will stop there and pass on to my colleagues. Thanks, Park. Dale, uh, let's have your thoughts. Thanks, Joan. Um, I, I think when, we, when we're looking at these kinds of spaces that have been, you know, a lot of places have been developing these for the last decade, and, and so it's an ongoing conversation. I would hope that we, we take a shift towards the even greater shift toward the less predetermined and the more organic development. That we, that we think really flexibly about our spaces rather than building monolithic spaces. And by monolithic spaces, I mean big visualization walls and heavy technology installations. And sort of, if we put these really fancy things, people will come into the library and use them and instead sort of build it up in, in, this, in a succession of waves so that we can set things up and take them down as, as technology cycles, which it does so quickly. I would hope that during the pandemic, we've all learned the value of the quick and elegant pivot. And that's kind of what I'm thinking that in these spaces we need is the ability to sort of change direction without having to reinvest capital funds and retrain and so forth. So that's a big one. More generally though, I've thought about this in terms of like our reopening has really focused on, well, what do we open and when? You know, we have to open up reading space for students, but when does the digital scholarship center open up? When does special collections open up? When does the archives open up? And what I'm describing is there's a center and there's a periphery. And literally in most libraries, these things tend to be peripheral. They're not by the door, some places they are, but most of them tend to be on the top floor, the bottom floor off in some random space that was found for these kinds of things or in the basement in the case of special collections, which I've never understood in most places. Um, and is it time for those things to start being the core of the library? In other words, should we have these kinds of spaces where a library where there's just an assemblage of these specialized spaces and there are study space, there's study space and, and, and contact space and socializing space sort of in the interstices. And the, that observation is based in part on, we, we plan these specialized spaces and then we open up huge acres of space with a lot less planning and thought going into it. And that space is really, it's, it's like a lot of space at universities. It's, it's utilization is really spotty. At times it is overrun with humanity about 20 days a year, typically around exams and maybe the first couple of days of the semester. Then it falls into steady state. And for part of the year, it's a ghost town. There's just nobody there. And so we're wasting a resource. And what could we do in that space in that time that it's being wasted? And that's what I'm talking about, these, these specialized spaces. And behind all of this or underlying all of this is a question that really obsesses me is how can we bring in particular graduate students and faculty and postdocs back into contact with libraries, literally back into the space in some ways, um, which I think is a benefit for them because a lot of them seek third spaces and something besides their disciplinary space to do and meet colleagues from other, from other, other disciplines. But also I mean it more virtual, more generally, like how do we bring people back into contact with libraries where they begin to see the value propositions beyond just having analog collections or digital collections and study space for students that they actually begin to see us as you know, partners in research ideation and research development and so forth. And, and that's an area where I think there's so much desire and so much capacity in libraries to do, to do great things for universities that is being woefully underutilized at, at I think pretty much any institution with a few exceptions and maybe with a few pockets of, of exception at some institutions. So, so I think a lot about this and they're not gonna come back for study spaces and they're not gonna come back for you know, big um, you know, computer labs. They're gonna come back for something that actually enhances their, their experience and, and gives them a, a really um, an enhancement to, their, to their, uh, what they get from their faculty, what they get from their faculty, what they get from their department. Thank you, Dale. I can't resist um, adding a few comments of my own in response. Um, I do agree that we need to highlight um, what you refer to as specialized spaces uh, front and center. And that can be done either by placing the spaces themselves there or sometimes with special collections, placing both an analog and a digital exhibit 
um, very near the entrance. Ohio State, at least when I visited there in their main library, had such an exhibit. And, and I've seen other a few others uh, like those, but I've never understood why libraries that spend so much money digitizing their special collections don't highlight them as you walk in the door so you know what, what they have to offer. I'd also mention um, the NC State Hill Library, which put the maker space with glass walls at the front right at the entrance, right as you come in. And so that was also this acknowledgement that we need to demonstrate, we need to show people what the 21st century library is and put it right up front. So I, I appreciate um, your perspectives. Thank you. And so. Thanks, Joan. And I will add, so we, um, I'm going to add some personal comments before I start off with in response. So we actually do that here at our library where we do have digital um, renderings of our exhibit that's in physical spaces. But what we realized was both those things had to be translated to a different online environment when our spaces shut down because no one could come see the digital renderings on the large monitor screens either. Um, and actually our maker space is out in the open here. So it's not even just behind glass spaces the tables and things are out in the open where students are seeing each other as you're walking past you can have a conversation with someone building something or doing something um so um that was just those are just personal comments for the moment so and joan uh, please feel free to cut me off if my answer goes on and on to how leaders should be thinking about planning for new or renovated technology spaces um, I will say for me, when this all started, it was like, well, we will now need to plan for all different kinds of learning scenarios. And, it, and, and then I had to take a step back and realize, well, where's the prioritization around this? So personally here, even before the pandemic, uh, my first uh, semester at UC Berkeley, I had just started working here. We had the fire season and we had to shut down. And that got me thinking around, okay, well, how are users going to use our spaces? They still wanted to use our stacks, but also how do we ensure that these things are, are these spaces could can be utilized when things change so and it was the fire and season um, uh, smoke we then had the pandemic and who knows what's in store next right so while this is challenging it also creates opportunities for innovation experimentation i truly believe that thing we need to experiment uh, maybe with smaller spaces things may not always work i use the google labs example but we cannot be afraid of failing we have to try something out put it in labs see how it works and if it doesn't take a step back revert go somewhere else um for us it was also around campus partnerships which what this brought around was thinking through our data and compute environments that we were providing um, that were on site and what pandemic made us think was well researchers cannot come on site to get access to their data and get access to their high performance computer environments. How do we ensure that the secure data that has certain compliance issues can now actually be served up, not just through VPN, but other secure mechanisms in addition to VPN? Um, there's also the training and support part that we often forget when we think of these high tech spaces. We build them and then how do we train our librarians, our student assistants, library employees, as student assistants who are working there um, to ensure that when a question comes in, someone can actually troubleshoot or are we always going back to the vendor or the high tech teams that have designed these things? Um, and, you know, taking something that Dale had said, sometimes we're just quick to react on anecdotal evidence of a few over understanding how the majority of the users will be doing um, the work and research in these spaces. So, yes, while there is this technological component, there's also the social and human interaction part that should really guide the use of this technology. And I do think we need to be responsive and not reactive, right? So what's expected of space changes? I think this is kind of what Dale was alluding to. So, um, sorry, I just lost my, yes, what's expected of these space changes? So we need to plan them with most flexibility and electrical and network outlets. For me, 
let's have all the electrical outlets you can let's have all the network outlets you can the space will find its use and then that use can evolve over time as the needs for efficient pedagogy and the needs for that space change you may realize the second floor is your entrance and in a few years there's this major remodeling project and now the third floor is your entrance and what was supposed to have been the front and center in, on the second floor now needs to either be moved but if it's this box with electrical and great network outlets because our wi-fi isn't always the best sometimes uh, we're working on it um it can be repurposed for the next use of that high tech, high touch or low touch space that is needed so um beyond that i also think it varies library while it where varies library to library um most users when they do want an interactive space, they want something with a large screen where they can work on their joint projects, they can show something, they can edit things, they can um, uh, teach each other what they're doing. And um, those spaces, interestingly, can sometimes be the easiest to plan. The complexity stems actually when high touch in-person spaces and interactions then need to be converted for remote operation or even hybrid. Like how does how do you train a student to use a laser cutter over Zoom? Or how do you train an employee to scan that awesome scanner that Dale has behind um, in his background? How do you use an how do you teach an employee over Zoom how to use that equipment? We actually had to do that at Berkeley because we were bringing back employees to do high touch digitization and we had to set up trainings over Zoom because this was back last year when we didn't even know if six feet of social distancing was okay. So how do you design for that? And that is what needs to be kept in mind. And then, as I was saying earlier, um, there are certain other spaces like your compute environment. So think about data security and data that cannot be accessed from outside of campus, be it HIPAA compliance or other reasons, not HIPAA, other compliance issues, I'm sorry, that you're thinking through. Um, and that's where the reflection and the realization needs to be that not everything needs to be planned for both some services really do not transition well to virtual environments and maybe they're not meant to transition and having that understanding before the work is initiated um, can be time and money saving so we're returning to campus right now um, and our biggest one of our biggest needs is actually not around having 3d modeling spaces or ar vr realization but it's actually ha around having teaching and meeting spaces that can accommodate a hybrid environment so the simple run-of-the-mill that people think about mics cameras that can capture all the angles and bring in virtual folks into the in-person space and provide that high flex environment so I will wrap up by making two points here. Um, first thing is training. I cannot stress enough around this. As leaders, when we're planning about designing these spaces, um, let's think about the training component to ensure that not only does everyone know how to use the setup, but also the software that's on the setup. And that's extremely vital so that your users can pivot and use the space to serve them and not the other way around where the users are making this trying to make do um, with the space that they have. Um, and the f other thing I will mention is often the neglected aspect, the maintenance, the unspoken maintainers and the maintenance. Um, the more complex the technology, the higher is your reliance on the vendor or the teams that provide it. So ask yourself the question, what does effective pedagogy look like? And will this setup serve or enhance it per the user and not based on our inherent implicit assumptions that we do sometimes carry around because of certain anecdotal evidence that we may have. So maintenance and training. And with that, I will pass back the virtual mic. Thanks so much, Saul. You gave us a lot of food for thought and you've touched on a number of things that I think um, are listeners, our participants are, are interested in. Um, my second question for you is, I've been hearing discussion of libraries thinking about developing additional spaces or, or converting spaces to support teaching and learning, such as high flex classrooms, which um, you've already, some of you have already referred to, and spaces for individuals to participate in virtual classes privately while they're on campus. 
And I'm going to ask you for your perspectives on this topic, but we also have a question in the chat that's related to this. And, and actually you touched on it a little bit, Sala. The question from Todd Grapone is, do you see new modes of storytelling, AR and VR, for example, and new modes of scholarship, remote research and remote teaching, influencing the library and changing and influencing perceptions on appropriate use of space? So let's tie those two things together, if you will, um, as you address this. And we're going to start with Dale this time. Thanks, Joan. Yeah, I, I, I would take this question in its two parts. And I would talk first about sort of developing the teaching spaces, high flex or technology rich teaching spaces, I'll call them. And, and the second part, which is about individuals and being able to participate in online instruction, online courses when, when they're on campus. Um, to the first one, I, I can I can I can probably get a little tiny bit ranty about this because I feel like that's that's sort of one of those evergreen topics in in the academy, which is that there are always the sort of the, the pedagogically uh, inclined or or adventurous who want to go really far in the direction of a really active classroom. And so six five six years ago, we would have talked about active learning classrooms. I haven't heard that phrase since I came to Alberta. You know, I just it just just, it seems to have fallen completely out of use. And the high flex is now a way to talk about it. And I realize they're not the same thing. I'm, I'm sort of making a fruit salad out of different types of fruit here. But the, um, but the concept is sort of the same. It's like, how do we create these, these courses where people can do things virtually and physically and where it all, all, all kind of comes together? Um, I, I have a lot of questions about that pedagogically. I have a lot of questions about it org organizationally. Because with active learning classrooms, we learned that they might look good. And the demonstrations in the steel case you or whatever it's called in Michigan might look really good, but at your institution, the number of faculty who can actually use that space is it's designed to be used. You can count on one hand, two hands. I don't care how big your institution is. Like it's just not that many people who are prepared. It's exhausting. It's exhausting to re to revamp your curriculum to teach in that space. It's exhausting to conduct teaching in that space with a lot of, lot of support. I don't think there are many faculty that would say that the increases they see for their teaching are or the, the supports they receive for their teaching are increasing, not decreasing. And so that's a question I think we need to ask about what we're asking faculty to do. I also don't think we've really done the, the work of what students want. What I hear anecdotally, but the anecdotes repeat themselves enough that it's almost like a assemblage of data points now, and it's almost a data set, which is that students <laughs> tolerate online. Students love in person and they really hate hybrid. Like they get really confused when they have to go back and forth. And so we have students on this campus as do a lot of you who have a number of classes and they come to campus for this class and then they go to this other class online. And I just say, what is the logic behind that? What is the pedagogical mission? Now, of course, it's a reaction to the pandemic but we should be good at universities and making this make sense and we don't in some ways. Um, so we, we really, um, we really need to think about this. And for, so for me, it's really a question of like, are we talking about field of dreams, build it and people will work themselves into that space or should we do this based on evidence and encounters with people and learning that? And, and like, like Sawa said, I mean like build these, build things that are flexible. And so I think that we can talk about these kinds of things, but unfortunately at universities really quickly, they turn over into the, you know, the, 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 the armada of technology and it's like, oh boy, now we've invested and now we have to maintain this and now we have to have staff who can actually fix that and we have to teach people how to use it. That's a high order for most institutions for pretty much anyone, I think. Second part of it, bridging into like spaces for people to do those, those kinds of, to do courses online on our campus. I have to say that when I, it occurred to me recently when I was having this conversation with some, with some people on this campus, that it's kind of oxymoronic to talk about this creating space in a physical library on campus so that people can participate in online classes. Now, the class is online probably because it's a large lecture class and it's considered unsafe for it to meet in a lecture hall that I can see out the window right there. But it's okay for those same students to walk into this building, which is full of just as many, if not more human beings breathing and moving and talking and take a class. To me, that just makes no sense. It shows the old logic of all of these pandemic restrictions in some ways. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not against them, but so they're, they're often counterintuitive and they often don't make sense. Like why forbid a lecture and let people come into a library and gather in large numbers? It just makes no sense to me. So I don't necessarily want to have a, a long-term conversation about this because I do feel like it's a moment we're having and this isn't going to persist. Students at this university are making very clear that they want in-person classes. So I think that we're going to see a return of in-person classes 
And I also don't think that, I think that we as, as I'll say, older attention challenged people, maybe because we don't like noise and we don't like bustle, we think that students need like a monastic, you know, soundproof cubicle to do an online class if they're in the library. I don't see that. I walk through our library and I see those spaces dead empty and I go into the really loud spaces and I see people with their earbuds in, in class and I'm like, we have silent space upstairs and yet it's a ghost town and they all pack together. There's something about they want people. They want to be around people, even if the people are doing a different class. And that tells me a lot. And I wish people at this university would come into the library and just sit and watch that for 10 minutes. I think the conversation around creating space for students to take online classes would flip on a dime if they did that. Thanks, Dale. I, some people call that studying along instead of alone. And, and I think it's a, certainly a phenomenon. But I, I, I can't uh, let it go by your some of your comments about active learning classrooms because I, I personally I do feel strongly about that they do have a purpose and particularly in the sciences and there has been a lot of assessment that has shown the differences that that kind of pedagogy makes in some of the large introductory science courses where students came to college expecting, say, to eventually go to medical school or go on to graduate school in the sciences, and they fail those introductory courses because the teaching was terrible. And so they've totally restructured some of those um, both pedagogically and spatially to um, include active learning. And there are results from a number of campuses. There are studies that show um, that, it, that it does work. And, but I agree, it takes investment. It takes investment of faculty time and it takes support from either IT staff or teaching and learning center staff or library staff or others to make it actually work. So I hope you don't mind my pushing back on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sawa, you're up next. Um, great, thanks again, Joan. And you know, this was an interesting question as I was typing in my response and thinking through this. Um, I actually took a step back prior to the pandemic. And my campus, again, just like most other libraries, we've um, we've always had certain classrooms equipped with lecture capture technologies um, that our academic technologies teams have always supported, right? So we've always had rooms where faculty have taught an online class, I'm sorry, an in-person class, which is being recorded um, and will be made available online later. Um, so with our return back to in-person learning and teaching, um, the needs for these such spaces have gone up, of course. Um, and often, as Abdil was saying, like the libraries get asked, like, will you be providing this? But short of specified and specific campus funding and direction of resources for this, it is really hard to maintain such classrooms. It is really hard to troubleshoot and 7 p.m. class when most, you know, when eight to five are the normal working hours for most team members, or uh, when you are running off student employees who are supporting a lot of these um, um, uh, front desk staffing areas. So um, th th that just adds to the complexity of who's providing these resources. And then as Dale was again mentioning, so now is it the library's responsibility to provide um, 500 individual pods where the large seminar classes can happen, or are open spaces where 500 students are sitting at the same time attending the same um, class. I'm not advocating one way or another. Different libraries have different um, responsibilities and different ways of approaching it, but those are the things that came to mind. Um, at at my, at my library particularly, we've always supported flexible classrooms for library instruction and other student usage um, during non-peak hours. They're generally, again, equipped with cameras and microphones and speakers. So they've always allowed for hybrid instruction. What the pandemic or these two years of actually working from home brought about was the software that was actually being used that people learned to use more in a more interesting way. So it wasn't like converting the space actually into a virtual environment, but rather learning those pedagogical things around instruction and instruction design that could make that virtual space more hybrid, more that could make that virtual space just as interesting as the in-person interactions and spaces. And in some cases, as Dale had mentioned, that just may not be possible. Um, so uh, for 
our purposes right now in short term, we're not making any changes except ensuring that our spaces continue to be equipped the way they were. Um, we are, of course, ensuring that there's supportive technology. So there are all these different dongles and adapters, but we're also a large campus, about over 40,000 students. So anything more than that definitely becomes very resource intensive. I will add that with the hybrid environment, there is this question of equity diversity that doesn't always get tackled. Um, are your transcription services the right way? Will the student who does not have, who has, uh, who, who are neurodiverse are able to handle this accordingly? And this really isn't as much about the high flex classrooms or whether the classrooms are virtual. It all again goes and centers around the pedagogy and are we ensuring that there's this equity where everyone can participate? And um, if there are students who are coming back to campus who may not have the technology or who may not have the dorm room spaces or may not even have a dorm space where they can participate, how are they ensuring that, um, how are we ensuring that they can actually participate in this. So I, I do want to stress here on the equity and the DEIA component quite a bit, because it's not just the hardware technology, but the software technology that brings it in. And then finally, what the key here is to, yes, take multiple scenarios into planning, but ensure that your front level operational staff are trained and prioritize those scenarios. What are 80% of your users asking for? Are, um, the faculty then equipped to use those scenarios and those spaces and um, just ensuring that people around are comfortable using those technologies in the ways that they were intended to be used for um, participation and interaction and the teaching and learning that is supposed to happen there. And uh, with that, I will pass this back to you, Park. I think Park. Yes, thanks, Saul, for making those points. And Park is next up, and I invite uh, all of you who are listening to type any questions you have in the chat, and we'll try to take as many as we can um, yeah. after Park answers this next this question. I, okay. I mean, I I invite what I, I like to refer to it as as productive cynicism. I think that Dale and Saul have demonstrated it excellently and hit all the points, right? There's this funding, there's resources and supporting all these spaces. And it, it sort of makes me want to take a step back and say, hold on here. Why are we talking about high flex? It has existed long before the pandemic, by the way, as a thing. Um, and its mission is very different than I think how it's being used colloquially now. So what is it about that that, that is suddenly of such interest now, which I'll answer second, you know, Socratic method, but also why the library? Um, uh, is it because the library is new to territory? Is it because no one wants to touch it? It's actually the third rail, and the library is going to end up getting stuck with this because those are all, you know, Salak and, and Dale talking about support. And is this where the excellence of actually doing this right? Because what we're talking about here in HyFlex is a space that, that you know, could be anything. It, it, um, I think largely what people see in it is just being able to rapidly deploy classes such that somebody can continue to teach and people can either attend physically or not, which has huge problems in terms of the equity of the experience for those who can make it or cannot for, for reasons that may not be of their own doing. Um, uh, a class attended personally is not great content, you know, if you're recording this and wanting to put it online. Uh, so if you follow that line of logic, then why are we just taking lectures? And when lectures will be held at the same time, with the same pace, with the same content, and just moving them into a camera on a laptop for the instructor and students listening in. This is continues to be sort of this enrollment and butts and seats sort of a, a model um, where this might be better. I think of, for instance, tying this right back to, to the library, um, the Jones Media Center and the edX studio at Dartmouth are a really interesting model. These are uh, two separate things, but the Jones Media Center is this great sandbox where students can develop hands-on media skills and can acquire these skills in this highly flexible place where with just pipe grid, they can bolt things on and bolt them off, right? There speaks to support. There's people who are, are, are IT, AV, production people who are and librarians thinking about media and even um, uh, story editors, helping students to create content and work on that and helping faculty to gain those skills as well in that same space in a safe way. 
um, there's an amount of funding there and and not just like let's build this thing and then be done with it the the biggest part of that funding and as a person who was on that project you know i kept saying i'd rather you build a white box and put nothing in it and be able to continue on to constantly change things day by day than to slap a bunch of screens on the wall and feel like we made something innovative right that never gets used and and that you can't keep up with um, it, there's another side of this too, which is, so now students can create content um, where they might have been typing or reading or, or doing AR, VR um, uh, work. They, they can do that there and they can engage with those tools and create content with those new frontiers. And with the edX studio, you know, this is a classroom effectively, but it's, they're creating content that is compelling and where students are learning of, of students of all varieties, by the way, we, we, we don't have time to unpack what it means to be a student when you can access this content, you can be an, an alumni trying to gain new skills in Excel right and, and diving into economics classes. Uh, anytime you want and it's compelling it's quick and it takes place of a lot of the. Um, pedagogical vector that lectures used to be mass marketing or mass dissemination with higher outcomes. And it completely displaces the need for that large hall or the need for the time or, or in the synchrony. Um, and by the way, these two spaces were planned separately. And when they started moving them and launching them, they suddenly realized that there was a synergy there and they're now co-located so that students can now see the professional work going on. And when a good idea happens in one or the other, it could be sprung out and dragged in. And now you're getting real world skills. I think there's an enormous lesson to be had there about why the library, what the space means, why high flex and, and um, uh, maybe even a slight nod to Todd's question about what AR, VR has as a role, which might be more just as a platform for gaining skills um, than necessarily something that is ported into the library as an environment or a, a service. Well, I think that if anything, if you weren't flamboyant, you were all provocative and lively. And I really, really thank you for that. Uh, we're almost at time. And so I've put two resources in the chat. Hopefully they've come up or did I just uh, delete them? Hold on a second. Um, There we go. Um, I want to call your attention to the series that we did at CNI uh, a little over a year ago, the um, Digital Scholarship Planning webinar series, because we do have one session on pandemic, we have another session on spaces, and there's lots of material that if this topic interests you, you may want to go back and look at the videos and PowerPoints. And the second one is uh, the se a session that I moderated for the Learning Spaces Collaboratory on a topic that was somewhat similar to, to this. And uh, there are lots of other good resources at that website. So I didn't see other questions in the chat. Um, thanks, Dale, for answering one of the questions there. Um, so instead, since we're just about at time, I'm going to close out the session by giving a really, really big thank you to Park, to Dale, and to Sala for an excellent session. And I really appreciate your input, your thoughtfulness, and your ideas. And that concludes the a meeting. I think Cliff's coming back on, and I hope I'll see some of you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for a fabulous session, and especially, Joan, thank you for uh, putting that together and moderating it. Um, an awful lot to think about there, and um, very grateful to you for uh, pulling it together. And yes, it was flamboyant as a conclusion for the day. Well done. Um, thank you all for joining us today. And um, please come back at about 1 Eastern tomorrow. And we will pick up the second day of our, um, our, our virtual event for um, fall 2021. I wish you all a good afternoon or evening as appropriate. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Take care. <laughs>